Puede ser en inglés si quieres, ha estado muy bien. Sí, todo sí bien. que o sea, amable, está bien, perfecto. Sí, perfecto. Pido? Muy bien, antes de comenzar, déjame presentarte, eh, Eric. Entonces, eh, egresado de la Universidad Veracruzana, igualmente obtuvo el doctorado del Instituto de, eh, de Física de aquí en San Luis Potosí, y también uno de los primeros egresados del grupo de, del profesor Jürgen, del cual es esta fiesta. Este, él estuvo también en Ontario, Canadá, en un postdoc y actualmente eh, trabaja en el Instituto de Física de la UNAM, y además de haber sido reconocido también por la Cátedra Muschinski en el 2020. Adelante, eh, Eric. Oh. Eh, muchas gracias, Elías. Um, ok, I'm, I'm going to give my talk in, in English. Let me share my screen. I'm going to need to share sound because I have some videos and I'm trying to... Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is the title of my talk, uh, Search for Sevens in Reactors and uh, Galactic Dark Matter uh, Using with, uh, with Liquid uh, Argon. Um, I only have actually one picture of uh, uh, my time in San Luis Potosí with Jürgen. Uh, uh, I, I, and I just found it uh, online uh, today because I don't have any other. As Ibrahim said, it was uh, those times uh, where we didn't have uh, cameras in our phones. And I don't have, uh, I basically don't have any. Uh, so I hope that uh, I will, uh, I asked Nora for a few pictures. So I hope I will get some uh, and, uh, to, uh, to share for, for, for when we meet. Uh, okay, so um, first, just a brief introduction about, uh, I, I want to do this first uh, in, before my talk. So uh, I met Jürgen in uh, 1999. Uh, I went uh, to San Luis Potosí uh, to this contest for the, the summer student program in foreign laboratories. Uh, uh, I was awarded actually one of the places and I went to DESI uh, in the summer of 2000. And before leaving San Luis Potosí, I talked to Jürgen and he told me that I could go and, and, and do my, my graduate studies with him. Uh, so when I returned from Germany uh, in the summer, I worked as a technician in his laboratory. Uh, and that was uh, from 2000 to mid 2001 until I could uh, go to the graduate uh, program in San Luis Potosí. And um, actually, I, um, that position is now held by uh, uh, Luz, uh, who is also present here. Um, and uh, I started my PhD in 2001. Uh, the first day uh, was on uh, 9-11 in 2001. And uh, I did my uh, PhD in char uh, variants in, in Celex. Uh, and at the end, I will uh, uh, mention a brief uh, some of the stories that I remember from San Luis Potosí and all, all that uh, time. And I finished in 2008. And then uh, for the next uh, 13 years, uh, I switched fields. And I'm going to tell you what I work now. And then at the end, I'm going to uh, um, talk a little bit more about uh, the, what I call the, the, the legacy that I have from, uh, from, uh, from Jürgen. Okay, so now uh, regarding my uh, talk, um, my uh, interest, uh, my area, the area where I work is in dark matter and neutrino physics. This is uh, just a brief introduction that I'm going to present about the physics that I do because it's, it's slightly different from, from what I did with Jürgen. Uh, when I uh, was working with Jürgen, uh, um, uh, low energy particle was a 15 GeV pion. And for me now, uh, low energy, it's uh, uh, a few EV or uh, even a few KV. So um, this is the pie chart of the universe uh, where, where I show the contents uh, of the universe, where we know that uh, the uh, matter that we know, the standard model particles is about 5%. And there is a 95% which is uh, divided, split into 69% uh, uh, called uh, dark energy and 29, about 29% 29 uh, 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 dark uh, matter. And this is the field where I work. I uh, uh, do experiments on direct detection for uh, dark matter. 
And uh, this is a slide that I always like to show. I'm gonna just flash some of these slides quickly. Um, I think that I failed uh, as, as, as uh, Ibrahim to spend one minute uh, per slide. Uh, although I still tell that to my students uh, uh, that they should do that. Uh, so this is basically all the evidence that we have. It's an impressive and overwhelming uh, number of observations on different scales. We have the very well-known rotation uh, curves of uh, galaxies. Uh, we have a galaxy uh, emission uh, of X-rays uh, in galaxy clusters and also gravitational lensing. Uh, so all this evidence points towards an unknown uh, amount of matter in the universe. And on the other hand, we also have uh, our uh, current best uh, model, Lambda CDM, and where uh, we have evidence from the CMB, from the cosmic microwave background. Uh, going into preci precision cosmology, we also have uh, abundance of uh, primordial elements uh, that's usually combined with predictions from uh, nucleosynthesis from the Big Bang. And also we have uh, structure uh, formation. So basically uh, simulations uh, 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 at a large scale in the universe. So uh, all these points to, to this unknown type of, uh, of, the, of uh, matter. Uh, and uh, there are many, many uh, possibilities, uh, some even modifying the laws of nature like uh, gravity or relativity. Uh, the evidence also uh, it points uh, uh, in favor of a particle, and there is a uh, there are several evidences uh, or possibilities uh, models that uh, uh, could uh, point to this dark matter. So, uh, what we know about dark matter basically is what we uh, uh, don't know about what, what dark matter cannot be, and uh, we know that it is uh, uh, in the interacts gravitationally. Uh, it is stable and, uh, uh, or long-lived. Uh, it has to be cold or warm. Uh, it cannot be any of the particles here in the standard model. It has to be electrically neutral and uh, it, uh, no color and it, it interact, interacts very, very uh, uh, weakly. So uh, this, this, is, this calls for physics beyond the standard model. And this, again, I show a range of possibilities of masses and a, a um, um, uh, candidates. Uh, at some point, the neutrino was a candidate, uh, but I, it was ruled out because uh, it is relativistic. Uh, and axions, uh, we have also WIMPs, which is the field uh, where I uh, work. And this is basically one of the most discuss, discussed candidates. Uh, it's a particle that uh, very likely was produced during the Big Bang in, in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. And basically, as the universe expand, expands and cools down, these particles uh, very rarely now interact with each other, uh, and then uh, they uh, freeze. And uh, uh, they decouple from the ordinary matter. And uh, uh, there are still around some of them with densities of a few uh, per liter, depending on, on the mass. And uh, I know that a lot of people uh, uh, think about uh, all these SUSI uh, models uh, uh, coupled to that matter, but, in, but we don't know actually the coupling between the standard model and the dark uh, uh, sector. So, uh, and the standard model is very rich, so it's very likely that the, this dark sector could be uh, also very, uh, very uh, 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 rich. So how do we detect these particles? So basically we are looking for uh, elastic scatters with nuclei. And this is a cartoon basically where we have a nuclei here and then a dark matter particle will come, will interact here with the nucleus. There will be a recoil of a few kV uh, and that's what we measure. Uh, that's one of the ways that we, uh, uh, how we search for this dark matter. Uh, there are other possibilities also, indirect detection and production in colliders. But basically that's what we, uh, what, uh, this, is, this is the area that I will uh, present now. And then we basically calculate the rate based in some assumptions. And historically, uh, we uh, search for two types of, co of couplings. One that we call a spin independent, which is just basically goes proportional to the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And then, then one what we, that, that we call spin dependent that couples to the spin of the nucleus. And this is basically the cross section. And this is what we do. Basically, we have a, a, a um, um, differential rate, a rate of events, and we have four main, com main components. 
uh, first we have the dark matter density component. We don't know the mass of the, of, the, uh, of the dark matter particle. Then we have the particle physics component here with the cross section, which is expressed from either a spin independent or spin dependent. Then the nuclear part, uh, 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 um, uh, the nuclear part. And finally, the velocity distribution of dark matter in, in the galaxy, galaxy, assuming a, a, Mox, a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and with some uh, uh, uncertainty. Then we put all this together. We don't know the cross section. We don't know the mass. And then what you, you usually see in these experiments is a plot of uh, the uh, wind nucleon cross section versus the uh, wind uh, mass. And here are some uh, experiments that, uh, well, uh, regions that had been ruled out by some experiments, some models on, 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 on possibilities for dark matter. And this is the coherent neutrino scattering from uh, solar neutrinos, uh, uh, um, atmospheric uh, and diffuse supernova neutrinos uh, that at some point will be an irre irreducible uh, background. So how to catch a wind? So basically we live in, in a dark ma matter halo. We have a local density of about this uh, uh, value. Uh, um, and uh, what we are looking for is for the uh, coherent elastic scattering of the nuclei. The problem is that we have many backgrounds from natural radioactivity. Uh, this is, these are neutrons, muons, uh, beta decays, gammas, alpha decays, and even neutrinos. And basically when we uh, uh, account for all these, we are talking about 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 events per ton per year. And uh, we need to reduce those because we are looking for, uh, at this time, uh, experiments are sensitive to one event per ton per year. So basically what we do is that we go underground, we shield the experiments, and we do a careful selection of the materials uh, to avoid radioactive uh, uh, um, uh, impurities or to minimize them. Uh, besides that, that only gets us to probably uh, 10 to the seven, 10 to the uh, eight, six or eight uh, uh, reduction, we still need to develop another techniques to distinguish uh, electro, uh, nuclear recoils from electronic recoils. And this is basically the receipt for direct detection of dark matter. We are basically looking for uh, tiny energy deposits, basically recoils of, uh, this is non-relativistic, so we are basically searching for a 50 kV um, um, uh, uh, nuclear recoils, and uh, as I mentioned, the background suppression by going underground, by having a uh, shielding and the, the careful choice and preparation of the materials. And these are just uh, uh, three examples. I'm not gonna talk about this. I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, in the experiments that I will present. This is basically the background discrimination where we uh, uh, discriminate the electron recoils uh, against the nuclear recoils. And then we just basically uh, uh, use uh, large target masses. We scale our detectors uh, to uh, tons, basically that's the, 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 the status of the experiments. So the experiments where I have been working are uh, at Snow Lab. This is uh, the deepest and cleanest uh, large space international facility in the world. Uh, it's two kilometers underground in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, it's a, a very clean uh, laboratory with a physics program focused on neutrino physics and, and dark matter. And uh, here is the snow cavern. That's uh, the home of the snows experiment that in 2015 was awarded the Nobel Prize in, uh, in physics. These are some pictures of the underground uh, laboratory. Here is the entrance of the lab. And this is basically the areas, the halls, the caverns of the lab. Uh, here is one of the experiments uh, where I work. And I spent uh, six years there uh, as a postdoc and uh, four years as a postdoc and then two years as a research scientist. And basically everything you see here is clean uh, at levels uh, uh, near what you find in a, in, in, in a, in a company where the, they fabricate our uh, drops, right? That's the, basically the cleanliness, cleanliness. So the most radioactive place in the lab, it is this corner here. And that's the a coffee machine. So coffee is basically the most radioactive thing that we have uh, on the ground in, in the lab, uh, besides the calibration sources, right? I, I guess the, 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 the cabinet with the calibration sources, that's the hottest, uh, the most radioactive place in the lab, but uh, second is this. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, at the end, I probably, if I have time, I will present a, a video of the laboratory. 
Um, I'm going to talk now about uh, two experiments. Uh, one is uh, DEEP3600 uh, and uh, the search that we do for dark matter using liquid argon. This is the, the collaboration in 2018 uh, when they came to Mexico City to the Institute of Physics at UNAM. We are basically uh, more than 80 researchers from Canada, Germany, Italy, Mexico, Russia, Spain, the UK, and US. Um, um, and these are the participating, uh, the collaborating institutions. Uh, in DEEP, uh, uh, we basically use liquid argon. And that's because argon is a, a scintillator. Uh, basically, when nucleus are scattered, uh, they are detected because of the scintillation light that they uh, emit. And we use something that it is called uh, pulse shape discrimination to suppress beta and gamma events, basically electron recoils. And uh, that's because uh, uh, when uh, there are nuclear recalls in argon that produce uh, dimers, and uh, there are two uh, different lifetimes uh, for uh, the two states, the argon singlet and triplet, and that those are associated with uh, electron recoils or nuclear recoils. And here you can see a, a, a pulse from, from, from an electron recoil and here from a nuclear recoil at the bottom. And we, call, we define something called the f prompt, which, which is the fraction of light in a time window of, time window of 150 nanoseconds divided by the total uh, PE. And that basically splits the electron recoils here at the bottom from the nuclear recoils, and that reduces our backgrounds. And um, we use argon because it's easy to purify. It has a high light yield. Um, um, and uh, um, we started operating uh, one detector as a prototype, DEEP-1, which was consisted of seven kilograms. And now we have running DEEP-3600. It's a... Uh, um, uh, um, it's uh, more than three, uh, three tons. We actually have 3.3 tons of argon now, and we, use, uh, we have 255 PMTs. This is the detector. We have here the uh, acrylic vessel filled of liquid argon, and uh, then we have the 255 PMTs uh, separated by 50 centimeter light guides, also made of acrylic. We do this because the PMTs are the hottest components in the detector. They, they are made of borosilicate glass that produces lots of neutrons. So we need to keep them away from the detector and also because they operate at room temperature. So this is cryogenic and we have a gradient, a temperature gradient here. And all this detector is basically uh, immersed in a water tank of uh, eight meters uh, by eight meters, eight meters tall and eight meters uh, uh, diameter. And uh, this is basically how we uh, uh, built the acrylic vessel. It was made at uh, RPT, Reynolds uh, Polymers in Thailand. And then it was shipped in a boat uh, to um, uh, Canada uh, in four pieces. So the, then they were put in an oven. And then this sphere was uh, transported underground to Snow Lab. This has been up to date the largest object uh, shipped underground. And this is when uh, it reached the cavern. This is actually the water tank. And this is where we couple the neck uh, of, the, uh, of the detector. And this is a very uh, nice uh, pictures of the detector when we couple the light guides underground, then uh, we put some uh, polyethylene and some other shielding. And that's nearly completed. We, you can see the, the back of the PMTs here. And of course, when you spend 10 years building a detector, so you uh, get the National Geographic to go and take a picture because it looks uh, impressive to have this detector. Uh, uh, um, and uh, this is a, a picture, uh, a very nice picture. And you also get uh, to be on TV. Uh, there is a, series, a, a TV series on CBS, Scorpions. And uh, so at some point, uh, we noted that in some of the episodes, uh, the... Uh, um, the characters in that uh, um, in series, they had to go to a lab underground. And that's because the, a, an experiment had claimed to detect dark matter and the government wanted to be sure that uh, uh, it was uh, correct, the claim, because the experiment was requesting, requesting lots of money uh, uh, and uh, the government needed to be sure. So they hired these detectives uh, to, to investigate if it was correct. And we noted that they, take, they, they took the shape of our detector and actually our PSD discrimination, it seems that they look for the deep uh, in, 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 uh, to make this episode. Uh, but anyway, I don't follow this series, but it was exciting to see uh, the experiment uh, on TV. Uh, I wanna quickly just uh, flash some of the uh, details of the experiment. 
uh, we had to uh, actually sand uh, to polish, uh, we could say, the, our detector underground. And that's because contamination from the air uh, that uh, plates out in the surface of the acrylic and that uh, uh, leaves uh, lead to 10 uh, and polonium, but lead to 10 is very complicated because it has, it has a half life of uh, uh, 20 uh, years, more than 20 years. And we need to basically send a few micrometers uh, from the detector uh, to remove these uh, backgrounds. Um, we have a very clear uh, discrimination of the electromagnetic recalls and the nuclear recalls, as you can see here, these are uh, the uh, beta decays. This is the potassium 40, the 1.46 MeV line, thallium 208. And here we, we can see uh, all the alphas, uh, surface alphas in the detector. And here, very tiny, it's the wind region of interest. And this is basically our background model in the ER uh, electronic recoil band. And these are some of the backgrounds. We also have uh, very nice calibrations of the detector. Uh, basically, we calibrate. This is the energy calibration and the number of photoelectrons detected for a few lines, natural lines as the potassium, bismuth, and thallium, and of course sources as this as a sodium twenty two source. Besides the optical property, properties, I are studied with a, a light injection uh, using uh, fibers. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a very uh, uh, well controlled and we understand our detector very well. So uh, we started uh, construction in 2012. Uh, basically we begin the first fill in 2016. We ran for one week, but, but then we have a seal failure in our detector. And then we began a second field in 2016. We finished uh, in October, 2017. I'm gonna present some data that we uh, basically uh, 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 analyzed uh, and, and, and and put out the results in 2019. And uh, um, currently the detector is uh, empty. We are doing some upgrades, fixing this seal failure. And hopefully next year, we are going to start filling it again and, and go for another search. So basically this is what we found. We found zero events in the region of interest. This is the region of interest, which is defined by these cuts. Uh, basically it is defined as a 1% nuclear recoil acceptance loss, uh, a 0 0.05 electron recoil backgrounds, and this is kinematics from uh, WIMPs, uh, and then uh, half uh, neck uh, alpha decays uh, 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 um, uh, as, as backgrounds. Uh, we ran the, for 2,231 uh, light days, and uh, we had a fiducial mass of 824 uh, kilograms. And this basically allows us to put these limits. This is the deep 3,600 result. Uh, it's this work, and we are still not competitive with uh, Panda uh, X, with LOX, and with Xenon one ton, with the Xenon detectors uh, in the spin independent uh, channel. And uh, but we, ho we hopefully next year, when we have uh, the full detector running for three years, we will be able to reach this uh, space uh, parameter uh, region. We are uh, slightly better in some isoscale uh, isoscaling violation scenarios. I'm not going to present these. I'm gonna briefly just to talk about, uh, because that's related to the work that we do at uh, IF. This is deep, this is the detector. Uh, as you can see here is with the light guides with the PMTs. And this is how it looks like now, uh, the detector uh, uh, with the water tank uh, empty. And, uh, uh, and we are about to, or we are doing the upgrades uh, in, in uh, the detector. So this is one of the experiments. This is, this is the, basically the search for dark matter using uh, argon. And uh, uh, this is the first part of my talk. And the second part, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the SVC, the scintillating bubble chamber. This is a 10 kilogram liquid argon bubble chamber for dark matter and, uh, and, and, and sevens. And this uh, basically, I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, uh, reactor neutrinos uh, uh, through uh, sevens. And in order to detect these, uh, this is basically the sevens process as you can see here to the, uh, um, um, via the set zero uh, uh, boson. And uh, basically due to the coherence, we have uh, energies, uh, we need energies of the neutrinos of roughly, uh, we could say 10, uh, 50 MeVs. And that gives us uh, nuclear recalls of 50 kV, which is basically what we do in, in the search for uh, dark uh, uh, matter. We, so we basically need, as in a dark matter detector, 
a very low threshold and recalls of a few uh, kV. And uh, this process that uh, was observed for the first time uh, by the coherent collaboration in 2017 has a, a, a high cross section compared to the uh, inverse beta decay. So basically that's something very good. Uh, we need to go to low thresholds and even do an event by event discrimination, but uh, fortunately the cross section is very large. So, um, so basically we just need to put one of these uh, uh, dark matter detectors similar to those near a, a, a nuclear reactor to search for this process. This was measured in a, uh, the expulsion uh, source Basically, nobody has observed uh, coherent and uh, near uh, uh, cohe these coherent interactions near a reactor, and that's what one of the uh, parts of the physics program that we are aiming for in the SVC uh, collaboration. But first, let me talk about uh, bubble chambers, um, uh, just to present uh, in what is based this what, what this work is based on. This is the Pico collaboration. Uh, and this is the uh, time when they uh, uh, were in here in Mexico City in 2016 um, and uh, uh, at the Institute of Physics. This is the collaboration. And uh, we were discussing earlier, right, about the, this visit uh, with uh, Peter Cooper and all this came uh, to Mexico uh, to, for the collaboration meeting. And basically uh, we use bubble chambers, uh, not the typical bubble chambers used in the 70s in the particle physics experiments. This is slightly different. And uh, we basically have a, a synthetic quartz jar, uh, which is filled with uh, a liquid. We usually use these liquids, uh, CF3I, C3F8, uh, and that's basically because we are, use, we are aiming uh, to search for spin-dependent interactions but, uh, through uh, fluorine, which was, uh, has spin. And this, then this uh, uh, jar, this uh, quartz jar, is immersed in a, a, a stainless steel pressure vessel uh, uh, filled with an hydraulic fluid. And this is connected uh, basically to a piston. Well, uh, lately it's a slightly different the system, but basically the idea is that uh, when particles come, uh, this liquid is in a superheated state, and when particles interact, they uh, evaporate a small amount of material that produces a bubble. And uh, we have four cameras that take pictures of these uh, um, uh, uh, bubbles. And then we have acoustic uh, piezoelectric sensors that detect the sound, the pop, when uh, uh, the, the bubble is produced. And at that time, basically uh, what we do is to compress the system to about 200 PSI to basically recondense the fluids. And then we expand the detector after a few seconds, basically to leave it again in a superheated state. And this is working in cycles like this that, I, that you can see in this uh, uh, sketch. Basically, there are recompressions after each uh, event. And basically, the physics behind this is just a competition between the surface energy and the latent uh, heat. Uh, uh, and everything, this is, is basically explained by the uh, sites uh, model, the hot spike model, and the uh, um, uh, production of bubbles, basically. The nucleation depends on the energy and the stop and in the stopping power. And this is very interesting because since uh, uh, it only depends on the stopping power, uh, that means that there are some particles that even having, having high energy, they, are, they cannot produce bubbles. And this is basically this diagram, I have the stopping power and the energy and the region where we can nucleate bubbles. And basically the electrons, even having enough energy, they uh, don't uh, 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 deposit the energy in the, uh, in, in the, within a critical radius to nucleate bubbles. What we, uh, uh, what, what uh, do produces uh, pro, uh, bubbles are uh, the alpha decays uh, and the nuclear recoils from carbon, fluorine or iodine, uh, according to the elements that we use. So basically these, these detectors are insensitive to electrons and gammas. This has been measured in situ with uh, calibration chambers and also with uh, uh, um, our detectors. And this is basically the energy threshold at which we operate the detectors and the probability of nucleation from electron recoils. And um, uh, this is for C3F8 and for CEF3I. And uh, these detectors are sensitive to basically, if we remove the, the, their uh, insensitivity to electrons and gammas, to alpha decays, to neutrons and to uh, WIMPs. And uh, these are basically um, events from a neutron calibration source. Neutrons are very special because uh, they produce 
one or more than one bubbles, and that's because the mean free path of the neutrons in these fluids is about a few centimeters. So we uh, uh, get to measure uh, neutrons by, the, by their multiplicity, uh, uh, multiple to single ratio. And alpha decays are uh, uh, nuclear recoils and the alpha tracks, and they produce only one, uh, one bubble. And of course, we expect that WIMPs produce one bubble. And uh, so this basically allows to, to measure neutrons, to observe neutrons in our detectors. And then we only have to discriminate alpha decays from WIMPs. And alphas are very interesting because they are basically a nuclear uh, recoil and the uh, 40 micrometers length uh, uh, that uh, the uh, alpha travels. And it happens that these are uh, louder. You can think of, about that the nuclear recoil uh, produces one uh, acoustic signal and the alpha decay consists of the nuclear recoil and the alpha track. So that signal uh, is uh, uh, louder, we could say. And this was discovered by the Picasso collaboration. And you can actually here uh, see the acoustic parameter uh, where we can differentiate uh, two regions. These are the single recoils produced by uh, neutrons, single uh, uh, nuclear recoils produced by, by a neutron uh, source and an ambi source actually, and then in in black and in red you can see the uh, alpha decays. Actually, this is alpha calorimeter because we can observe two signals from uh, two different alpha energies. There are actually three uh, from the uh, uranium and thorium chains, and uh, these are the acoustic signals from the neutrons and from the alphas, and we can discriminate these very well uh, uh, in our detectors. One thing about these detectors is that they are energy threshold detectors, uh, so we cannot know the energy uh, on an event by event uh, basis. Uh, we do the usual background suppression by going underground, by uh, um, water shielding uh, our detectors. Basically, we have a shielding around the detectors and clean materials. And uh, then the backgrounds, the alphas are discriminated by the acoustic parameters, while the neutrons by the multiple bubbles that they produce. And we have been operating different detectors on underground at Snow Lab. We are actually now uh, um, um, uh, building a ton scale detector, which is peak of 500. We use bu uh, bubble chambers because these are uh, zero background, basically. Uh, we uh, can scale uh, our experiments uh, very easy. Uh, and we can uh, have uh, low energy thresholds uh, depending on the fluids. And we actually can uh, 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 use different uh, targets. And actually the SVC is based on the an argon detector that I will uh, um, explain uh, briefly. And in terms of search for dark matter, we, ba we basically have uh, different uh, uh, um, um, possibilities this is under uh, an effective field theory framework where we have different operators that go into the interaction that depend on the spin, on the transfer momentum or the velocity of the particle. And basically this is for the different uh, elements. And as you can see for fluorine, these are sensitive to uh, spin dependent, which are these two terms uh, uh, in, the, uh, um, um, uh, um, in this effective field, uh, field theory. And by switching to different uh, fluids, we can basically have uh, uh, study other uh, uh, interactions and uh, we need other treasures. These are some pictures of our detectors. This is basically the quartz jar. Uh, here are the acoustic sensors that we uh, had in Pico 60. Actually, during my postdoc position, uh, uh, three uh, uh, scientists, I was one of them, uh, were in charge of building this detector underground at Snow Lab. Uh, two from, from Fermilab, Hugh Lippincott, Lippincott and Andrew Sonnenschein. And this is actually the day that we put this uh, jar inside of the pressure vessel that you can see here. And uh, this is the detector inside of the water tank. Uh, this is how the pressure vessel, vessel look like. These are the viewports for the four cameras that you can see here. These are the LEDs uh, for the, to illuminate our detectors. And uh, um, uh, here's another picture. I like to put this because I am this one. I, you cannot see my face, but... Uh, because I'm facing the detector, but, but I'm here <laughs> uh, during the construct, construction of the detector. So we have, uh, after uh, more than 10 years at Snow Lab, we have produced world leading limits in uh, the search for dark matter uh, uh, through spin-dependent wind-proton uh, couplings. These are our latest results, where basically we are even more competitive than uh, indirect detection, indirect uh, detection experiment, experiments. We actually have a, a limit combined with IceCube, 
uh, uh, but these are from the results from our run in 2019, uh, uh, um, where we reached this sensitivity of uh, roughly 10 to the uh, negative 40, 10 to, uh, uh, slightly better than that for wind masses between 10 and uh, 30 uh, GeVs. And these are basically the results that we have uh, uh, produced. So this is basically the experiment. This is the PICO experiment uh, at Snow Lab. And uh, after this, uh, well, continuing with this OBSEX program, a uh, fraction of the, of the collaboration uh, uh, led by Eric Dahl at Northwestern University decided to uh, 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 endure in a, in a new experiment where, uh, that it is called now the SBC collaboration. It's a small uh, fraction of people. Actually, this, this picture is from 2019. So um, I need to update it uh, from our latest collaboration meeting. We are now, we have doubled the amount of people here. Uh, uh, the collaboration consists of uh, 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 institutions from the US, Canada, and UNAM in, in Mexico. And the idea is to develop one of these bubble chambers, but using uh, liquid argon, uh, basically combine what we can do with DEEP uh, with uh, what we can do with uh, 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 the PICO uh, bubble chambers. And that's because then now we have three channels. We have the acoustic signal, we have the images of the bubbles, and we also have scintillation signal. And Eric's uh, Dahl group started uh, uh, developing first a xenon bubble chamber uh, at Northwestern that operated at a threshold of 900 EV. It was only a 30 gram uh, uh, um, uh, target. And uh, uh, after the creation of the SBC uh, collaboration, so the idea is to develop an argon bubble chamber, uh, bubble chamber uh, with a threshold of 40 electron uh, EV. And uh, the aim is to have a 10 kilogram detector uh, um, um, uh, to uh, also detect basically the uh, scintillation light uh, from the argon. Here are some pictures from the xenon bubble chamber that uh, developed at Northwestern University. And of course that's because uh, we, uh, uh, Eric Dahl observed that uh, basically uh, there is an outstanding electron uh, recoil discrimination uh, for uh, xenon. And um, so this chamber was explore, uh, exploring uh, thresholds down to 900 AV, EV and no gamma induced electron recoils observed. And uh, of course this was uh, observed uh, years ago by Glasser uh, when he developed bubble chambers, he had actually to spike the, the bubble chambers to observe uh, electron recoils. Uh, so it was uh, uh, the, the, the rejection, uh, the probability to produce electron recoils is very low, and this is suitable for dark matter searches and for uh, sevens. This is basically the detector, uh, uh, basically 10 kilograms of liquid argon spiked with uh, a few ppm of uh, xenon. Uh, with the CPMs immersed in the uh, hydraulic fluid, which is uh, CF4, operating at these cycles. And this is basically the CAT model of the detector, which is uh, being commissioned right now at, in Fermila. Actually, um, unfortunately, I, I didn't have time to put some pictures that uh, we have uh, recently from last week, uh, but uh, I, can, I can share with you if you are interested uh, uh, for this, uh, the development of this detector. Basically, um, the vessels, they, uh, uh, um, they are ready uh, uh, there's the design of the PNID for the fluids and the controls. The scintillation detection uh, system is under design and fab fabrication. And basically uh, it's uh, assembly operations on surface at Fermilab uh, and calibration will go from uh, 2019 up to 2022 actually. It's extending uh, until next year due to the uh, COVID situation. What's the physics that we can do? Well. Uh, there are two possibilities. We can go for dark matter. We actually will have two detectors. One will go underground to Snow Lab to do a search for uh, dark matter at uh, low wind masses between uh, one and uh, 10 uh, GV. This is uh, uh, for a target mass of five kilograms, uh, uh, five kilogram gear. Uh, these are the limits competitive with super CDMS. Uh, or, and what I will talk is about uh, sevens, basically, to uh, study, uh, to search for sevens near a nuclear reactor. And once the current uh, detector being commissioned at Fermilab is finished, it will be moved near to uh, a, a reactor uh, where we will search for sevens. And, and, and we, have, we are exploring two possibilities. 
One is, uh, uh, and both are in Mexico. One is a one megawatt research reactor at Inin uh, 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 near Mexico City. And the other is in Laguna Verde. It's a power reactor in the uh, East Coast uh, in, in Mexico. So this is basically the, the physics. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm nearly finished with this, uh, with my talk. And this is basically, uh, I'm gonna present uh, three uh, 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 studies that we did for the reach of this detector. And basically uh, by measuring coherent, we will be sensitive to the weak uh, mixing angle, the Weinberg angle. And uh, this setup A, it's uh, in in a, a, a one megawatt reactor. A setup B would be Laguna Verde, and this would be a, um, a similar reactor to Laguna Verde, but where we actually measure very precise the neutrino energy uh, spectrum. So we basically will be competitive uh, with at atomic parity violation uh, uh, experiments. We also will be able to be sensitive to uh, 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 set prime uh, bosons. When we study these scenarios of V minus L, uh, uh, gauge theories where a new uh, uh, mediator appears. So we will be uh, uh, better than uh, coherent and we will be competitive with beam dump experiments in some space parameter. And of course, uh, also with Atlas and LHCV and Babar, where we will be sensitive uh, to study and to search for these interactions. I uh, apologize, I missed uh, the, the, the citation for this. Uh, a paper actually it was accepted uh, last month uh, and it, it, it is published now in p in prd um, um and uh, we also will be sensitive to uh, the neutrino magnetic moment these are basically the results from coherent using the cesium cesium iodine uh, uh, crystal and the liquid argon detector and in our case the three scenarios in in laguna verde uh, will be uh, as sensitive as uh, Borexino and, and, and Gemma. So we will also be, uh, have the possibility to study the muon magnetic moment uh, uh, with uh, this scintillating bubble chamber. Uh, I forgot to mention that this at Inin is a 10 kilogram detector and at Laguna Verde is a 100 kilogram detector. So, um, um, but that will be uh, the physics reach that we will have. So, so basically this is the, the work that, uh, that I developed now I switch completely uh, uh, fields, I would say. I guess that the only thing that we share is are the PMTs um, and the Cherenkov light, uh, I guess. Um, uh, you, you will say something else, right, uh, Jürgen? Okay, okay. Okay, and, and just to finish my talk, I, I, I was thinking about, I was thinking, well, I know that in the morning, there were a few collaborators that explain, that, that talk about all the, uh, what is uh, uh, to work with Jürgen uh, as colleagues, right? And it was very exciting actually to learn many, many things about uh, 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 Jürgen's early career. And uh, I knew a bit about that. So I guess what I wanted to, to share is, 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 is uh, what, I, what I remember uh, the, 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 uh, about my time in San Luis Potosí with Jürgen, what a great experience was, was to work uh, with him and, and, and have my PhD. Uh, in San Luis Potosí. Uh, I, I, I share uh, what uh, Ibrahim uh, talked about all that. Uh, actually, I had forgotten about some of them. They are too familiar to me, like one minute for a slide. I always tell that to my students. And then Ibrahim reminded me that I learned that from Jürgen. So I, I, I kind of, I, I, I remember now that it came from you, but it's just natural in, in, in my uh, scientific life now. So, so the one thing that I remember that I actually, that I actually share with Jürgen and I learned from here, from him. It's just basically to discuss physics in, 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 with as much excitement as, as, as he does it. So, so you probably noted it, it with, uh, uh, with my talk now that I, that I try to explain a lot. Uh, that's what Jürgen does. It just basically, uh, I remember sometimes when I was doing my PhD that I just wanted the answer for one question. And Jürgen used to tell me a story behind that answer. And, and now I do the same with, uh, with my students. I mean, all that passion to, to explain uh, what, what you know about an experiment or, 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 or a physics result is actually what I, sh what I share. Uh, two years ago, Two or three years ago, we met in Leon, Guanajuato for the uh, particles and, and, and physics, uh, the, the meeting of the division. And uh, one of my colleagues told me that the resemblance with how I talk and I explain everything with Jürgen was scary. That's what he told me. So this is, this is some of the passion that I share with, with uh, 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 that, that I learned uh, from, uh, from Jürgen. Of course, 
uh, as we were talking in the morning. I also teach with pop. I learned that from Jurgen. Uh, um, um, and uh, also, I always look for a correct calculation of the uncertainties with my students. And that's something that, that with Jurgen, we always uh, 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 discuss about, about that. Uh, one of the other things that I that I remember playing football and softball with uh, Los Neutrinos, uh, all afternoons that we used to play. Uh, I, I actually went to Snow Lab and I founded a, a football team as well. But instead of Los Neutrinos, because that name was taken, uh, it was called Los Neutralinos, the Neutralinos. So, um, uh, um, um, and I remember having a great time uh, 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 sharing some experiences. I mean, uh, playing football and so forth outside of, of, of my uh, my PhD with Jurgen. Um, 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 I also uh, one of the things that I learned from Jurgen. I also still use uh, LaTeX and and, and and Emacs. Actually, this talk was made with a template from 1999 that Jurgen gave me for my let's say first official talk in a in a in a seminar in a conference. And my students come and go and they start using this keynote and all that stuff. I tell them that I will not put my hands in any of that, uh, of those. I still use uh, LaTeX and of course uh, Emac. And uh, I compile my talks every uh, time that I give one. I also have uh, uh, this feeling against, uh, I guess, I guess Windows. I don't know if I use such a strong words uh, by saying hating uh, uh, Windows, but I remember this one, one time when I was the technician at the laboratory uh, uh, with Jurgen, and I was just came from my uh, university, and I used to uh, to use Windows, and then uh, after half a morning, uh, uh, Jurgen uh, came uh, about uh, around lunch, and I told him, "Look, I made a partition, and I installed Windows in this computer and Linux at the same time." So when I say hate, is because I re I still remember when he basically looked at me and said. Delete that. I don't want that. Delete it now. Now he told me that, and that's what I had to do, of course. And and, and I guess that was uh, now. I, I I actually have to use some Windows because there are some national instruments uh, controllers that I cannot use uh, Linux, so I had to to go there. But every time that I uh, uh, um, start Windows, I remember that uh, time in the laboratory. And of course, uh, uh, speaking loud, very loud, and enthusiastic. That's something that that I remember that 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 that, that I actually also also do <laughs> when I talk to my students. Uh, drinking a beer as it should be. That's also I think I learned it from uh, from Jurgen. And and of course uh, I think that one of the things that I remember is disagreeing in which is the best football team in Mexico. That's the only thing that Jurgen always gets wrong. Uh, we all know which one is the best team, but Jurgen gets it wrong all the time when we talk about football. But anyway, I mean I mean. Uh, there, has, there has to be one bug uh, in the system, right? Uh, perfection uh, is not possible. Um, then after remem remembering all these, I, I was thinking, I was thinking um, uh, uh, what could be the best legacy uh, uh, for Jurgen, even if, uh, if, uh, uh, if I'm not involved anymore in uh, the experiments that he's working, that I took a different path. And I thought, well, you know, like, like a father and a son, and in this case, an academic father and a son, uh, and a son. I, I said, well, if I, uh, I'm about to graduate my first PhD student uh, in January. So, so, so what would I, would I like to see from him in, in the future? That's what I, what I was thinking. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, I go again with this independency uh, uh, that uh, Ibrahim was mentioning. Actually, I also told my students that if, if they ask for a postdoc position in Mexico, I'm not going to uh, write a letter of recommendation. They need to actually move far and do uh, something independent. That's what I uh, uh, told them. So I wanted to share, to share with Jurgen the field that I'm developing in, in, in Mexico, the experiments that I brought to the country uh, after finishing my PhD, the international collaborations that I just talked, uh, for example, in the PICO um, experiment that's uh, uh, where I am uh, leading the simulations uh, for uh, the experiment. Basically, I, I have uh, became a, a Monte Carlo uh, expert for uh, these collaborations. I'm chairing and leading these, uh, uh, these uh, groups. Um, at DEEP, I have a few students where we are actually uh, doing studies uh, uh, with a non-relativistic effective field theory to set constraints uh, in the experiment and also combined with other halo superstructures. My first PhD student is about to graduate. 
um, uh, in the SVC. I'm also responsible for the backgrounds and uh, simulations for this uh, WBS. Uh, basically, uh, uh, that's what I do in the, in the experiments. And of course, I'm also pushing for this uh, uh, proposal to deploy at Laguna Verde or uh, in IN. And uh, uh, at my return to Mexico, um, uh, this is my lab in, uh, at the Institute of Physics. I have a few uh, low background uh, detectors at germanium. I have actually three germanium detectors and alpha counters. I basically do instrumentation for these neutrino and dark matter detectors. Uh, I'm, I'm designing a prototype bubble chamber uh, and do gamma uh, spectroscopy and spectrometry, spectrometry uh, with uh, germanium detectors. I'm also pushing to develop the first underground laboratory in Mexico uh, at the, in the state of Hidalgo. So this is very well advanced. We are aiming to start construction this year. Of course, it will be just a 25 square meter uh, hole inside a, 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 a decommissioned mine in Hidalgo at only 300 meter water equivalent. It's not that depth, but it's still good to do uh, um, um, in research, uh, uh, prototyping, and, and, and environmental uh, radiation. This is one of the test deployments that we did uh, two years uh, ago. And uh, of course, I'm pushing for this uh, measurement of neutrinos in Mexico, the first uh, uh, detection of neutrinos, uh, 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 of reactor neutrinos via uh, sevens. And as, we, as I said, this is actually the proposal for ININ uh, one megawatt research uh, reactor. We had initial discussions and visit in late 2019, then the pandemic came, uh, but still we got a approval to deploy a scintillator detector uh, to measure backgrounds at ININ, and we will start communication with Laguna Verde. And I guess I wanted to share what my academic life had, 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 has been after, after I left uh, San Luis Potosí to show uh, uh, Jürgen that basically, uh, I made you proud. <laughs> and uh, this is actually my research group. This is actually two years ago. Uh, and this was last week, actually, we met after the 15 months. Uh, this is uh, only, these are only uh, two postdocs and the grad and five uh, PhD students. I didn't invite the undergraduates because that's another six and uh, 12 people, 13 people. That was too much uh, uh, for a meeting during the pandemic, but this is basically what has been uh, my academic life after uh, my training uh, with, uh, with Jürgen. So um, I just want to say, uh, Jürgen, happy birthday. Um, I would like to, I, uh, to go to San Luis Potosí and uh, actually have a, an in-person meeting. I hope that we can do it uh, um, later this year or next year. And uh, thank you uh, for everything. Um, and that's, that's it, thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, to Professor Eric Vasquez from the UNAM. And thank you for participating in this uh, Jurgen Fest. Uh, okay, we have some minutes for a question. We have around eight minutes for some question, please. So I want to first thank Eric for this nice talk, the nice work he is doing. And uh, Did I? Is it me or Julian? I wanted to tell him one, thing, one of the Thorium Lifetime, which you wrote with two students in, uh, at Snow Lab, which demonstrates that the decay rate does not depend on ultrasonic sound uh, or impeding <laughs> on the nucleus. I'm using it together with a paper from Peter Cooper, which to demonstrates that, uh, that the plutonium reactor on... Uh, I don't remember the name of the satellite, is independent of the distance from the sun to decay rate. Yeah, so these two papers I use as demonstration that Rutherford is right, nothing changes the lifetime of particles. Yeah, yeah. So I use something <laughs> of you. Yeah, I have a question. Have okay. you ever heard about liquid krypton detectors for WIMS? Uh, no. Um, I think that, I mean, we can use um, uh, helium, neon, xenon, argon. Krypton uh, uh, has, 
I, 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 I'm trying to remember that I heard somebody at Princeton or some were trying to do some research uh, with, with crypto, right? But it has some background uh, uh, with crypto. So, so I think it will be very complicated to, to do that. But, but, but I kind of, kind of hits me uh, to have that. We use crypto in deep uh, for calibration, actually, to calibrate the low energy uh, recoils, uh, electron recoils, right? But uh, as a dark matter detector, I think it will be very complicated because uh, of, I actually don't remember which one, it's a metastable state of Krypton. Um, yeah. And I see uh, Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm remembering the same thing, but I can't come up with the details either. Yes, but because in 1962, we have uh, 70 tons of liquid Krypton, which are, you, which are switched on, but only used sparsely. So, just, just thinking, yeah. Got the, got the idea of doing your yeah. talk. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess they somewhere. I gotta look. <laughs> yeah, I also hear about that, and and the only thing is that that's on surface, right? Oh no, no, you're you're not gonna. You could have the krypton, but uh, you'd have to take it on the ground to do anything useful with it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. If it is on surface, uh, it, it's impossible, right? That's uh, something. Cool. Of the of the neutrons, right? Uh, yeah. Cosmic uh, neutrons. Okay. So another question, please. Okay. Let me know, Eric. Okay. I I want to read and um, congratulations for sure again, by fair RT in the, uh, in the, in the YouTube uh, TV. Uh, okay, and I want to uh, congratulate, congratulate also to Jurgen for letting me participate also as chairman in this two session. And now I let you, thank you very much Eric for your talk again. And now I let- uh, Thank you Liz. Let me control to Professor uh, Alfredo Mendez. Okay.